Okay, hi everyone. This is uh, another journal club from Academic Life of Emergency Medicine. Today we have Dr. Stephanie Abuel, Dr. Alyssa Westring, Dr. Derek Cass, uh, and our guest of honors, Dr. Anupam Jena, who wrote the article. He's the lead art, uh, author, and we are uh, ready to start our discussion. If you and I'm Kinjal Satharaman, I'm from the University of Maryland, and I'll be moderating the discussion today. We have the article on the A uh, Academic Life and Emergency Medicine website. We have the abstract there. And so if you want to review it, you can do that um, while we're talking here or, or later. And um, we'll just jump right into our discussion. Our first question today is for Dr. Jenna. Uh, Dr. Jenna, why was it important for you to look at this question in particular? And uh, originally, when you started looking at the Doximity database, what did you expect to find? Uh, that's a great question. So, you know, this is a question that people have looked at for probably 30, 40 years uh, uh, at least. Uh, my background is an economist, and the economists have been looking at this issue for a lot longer. Uh, it's trying to understand male female differences in the overall uh, economy, and, and similar patterns uh, kind of emerge. We've done some work looking at male female earnings among healthcare professionals and physicians in particular. And not surprisingly, we find that once you account for a bunch of characteristics, female positions still earn less than males. And so the question was, is one of the criticisms of this literature has been twofold. One is that the studies tend to be smaller, uh, not nationally representative. And related to that point is they tend not to span, uh, the studies tend not to span across all specialties. And then the, the second major criticism is that I, I think people feel like certain measures of productivity are sometimes missing. And uh, our goal was to try to attack both of those criticisms up front by looking at this issue in a national way and looking at very rich measures of productivity that uh, one could not argue are not important in influencing the promotion decision. Do you, did you uh, have any particular challenges when you used this type of database, the Doximity uh, that, that you ran into, just yeah. for the researchers out there? Yeah, so the Doximity database is a, for those of you who are on Doximity or not on Doximity, rather, it's a terrific database. It essentially has information on almost every single position in the United States, almost a million positions. And we focused on the subset of positions who were uh, academic positions. So it's about 90,000 positions in, in the United States. Doximity collects through a variety of sources, uh, including actual uh, physician memberships, which about, almost 50% of physicians are members of Doximity now. In addition to, to what physicians themselves report, uh, Doximity has information on uh, where you went to medical school, uh, your specialty, when you graduate from medical school, how many publications you have uh, on PubMed, a number of NIH grants, uh, clinical trial participation, so a lot of rich characteristics that they get not only from the physicians themselves but from uh, online sources. The main limitation, of course, is that the information is not always self-verified for a physician. So for about 50% of physicians, it is verified by the physician themselves. But for the other half, it's just assembled from uh, other databases that are available in Doximity. And so that's the key limitation. Now, uh, Dr. Westring, were you at all surprised by these results? Did you expect, ex expect there to be such an explicit difference in promotion patterns um, given everything else being equal? Um, I wasn't particularly surprised by the overall um, pattern of promotion of women to full professor and associate professor. We've seen that a lot in academic medicine. But what I was surprised by was how that stayed there, that difference still was there after controlling for things like grants and publications and, and really starting to rule out some of the reasons why people have been saying we are seeing these differences uh, for so long. And um, what, what do you think the next step should be based on the research that you've done as far as looking at solutions? Um, well, uh, along with Dr. Abiel, we've been looking at um, the culture of academic medicine and looking at specifically which aspects of the culture are essential for women's career success. So starting to think about how do we assess different cultures um, and what key features of the cultures do we need to think about, um, I think would be a really good next step. So Dr. Abiel, what, what are some programs that you know of that support uh, and are successful in retaining women in academics, um, especially during key life event times? So great question. And you'd think, because we've been thinking about this issue for 20 years plus, that we would know the answer to that. 
but actually so much of the research that's been done to look at this has been focusing on the causal factors and documenting um, the issue like we're talking about today but not much research at all about interventions to support women faculty and all faculty uh, so so surprisingly I, I can't give you the answer based on research but certainly there's been a lot of experience here at Penn and, and other institutions on putting programs in place to support women faculty and again all faculty um, and uh, I, I can speak from experience um, that I see this as an issue that has to be worked on from what I call the top down and the bottom up. Top down meaning things that can be done that require the highest level of leadership of an institution. So the deans and the department chairs and the vice chairs, they need to be involved in the kinds of institutional changes that need to take place that have to do with some really important and traditionally um, constant factors, things like what constitutes promotion and, and what do we value, what do academic physicians do in a daily life that they should be rewarded for that would equal promotion. Things like setting up search committees and are they being set up and are they being um, asked to run uh, searches that are done in a way that there's broad representation and that unconscious bias issues are, are mitigated as much as is possible. Um, daycare, uh, issues about um, uh, whether or not you can take time um, after having a baby for um, some maternity leaves obviously or other leaves uh, when children are small really key things that are what I call the top-down issues and then bottom-up issues are um, what women if they're organized and the organization is key some kind of an organization in the school or in the specialty or in the institution that's a women in medicine program call it what you want some people call it an office for women's careers um, sometimes it's a vice dean or an associate dean um, but those kinds of organizations can do also a lot from the bottom up in terms of um, having sessions on faculty development and leadership. So covering topics like negotiation, time management, um, uh, work-life balance, uh, managing teams, uh, all of those issues that fall under the category of uh, faculty development or leadership mentoring. So both top-down, leadership is key, and bottom-up uh, are, are needed. Uh, and there's, of course, many ways to be creative in that. And I'm hoping that articles like this will push us to be more creative and then actually study those interventions to see what really makes a difference. Yeah, there still seems to be a significant amount of skepticism from people that aren't here. You know, we're sort of preaching to the choir. So what would be the ideal study for... Uh, your Dr. Jenna's study is amazing. I'm glad it's you know lead lead study in in a major medical journal. But there's still people who question that this this is a tr real thing that it actually does exist. What would you what would you say to those people, or what would be the ideal what would be the ideal study to appreciate um, or show the skeptics that this is a this is what's really happening for uh, for Dr. Jenna and Stephanie. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, Dr. Jenna's study is is excellent. I mean, he's controlled for the issues that often uh, the skeptics raise, and it's very reasonable. They should be looked at, and he looked at them. So this follows in a long line of of research that has documented that women are not progressing in their academic careers as their male counterparts are and that's a loss to all of us it's a right. loss to our patients it's a loss to our uh, research capabilities it's a loss to uh, academic medicine because of that talent that we're not taking full advantage of so I think the switch has to really be now to look at solutions and interventions and study them in a rigorous way right and and I think there is so I the question there should be no question at this point um, about what's really happening and, and that this difference really exists. Now, when I interview um, bright um, undergraduates for medical school or medical students for residency, they are uh, some of their resumes look like 
the resumes of some associate professors. You know, <laughs> they've saved the world at least three times, and mm -hmm. and um, and they do amazing things. But then at some point, somewhere, either during medical school or residency or a few years after, they're they're not pursuing. They're not. They're not on the leadership track. They're not on the academic promotion track. They're not accepting leadership positions in community settings. Have any of you noticed a, a time or a, a breaking point or a um, uh, a point in the in your in your research where these where we're losing where we're losing their um, their interest in pursuing leadership roles and promotion tracks? Is there have have any of you noticed a point? Um, when does that happen for most people? Alyssa? If, um, yeah, um, so I I'm I recently reviewed an article that was looking at what types of service men and women are doing and it was showing that um, women were doing a lot of service at the junior level but it was stuff that wasn't necessarily getting them recognized it wasn't the type of service that would get them to promotion men um, at the assistant professor level were doing less of that type of service and then probably spending more time on other things that would get them full, uh, associate or full promotion. So I don't think it's necessarily even that women aren't taking on leadership positions as much. It, it's maybe that the ones that they're picking early in their careers are taking a lot of time and they're not the ones that um, have that cachet at the university or at the institution to get them promoted. Um, so even just saying like men do take leadership and women don't, it's a little bit more complex uh, than that. There, um, that's, a, um, that's a very good point because I think a lot of people start doing lectures for residents and mm -hmm. um, education track kind of things that don't necessarily get the, get the, the value that, they, that it deserves. It's a lot of hard work that people mm -hmm. do and they don't, they don't rec necessarily get recognized. And I think that's slowly changing. I think there are institutions out there that are realizing that all of, all of it, every, every minute of our day has some value. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, you've, you've worked a lot with medical students. What's been your experience with, with this transition point? What do you think? So I think that medical students, you know, they come in pure. That's kind of what you're describing. They come into medical school excited and they have all this ambition and they don't really have a lot of conflicts. And as those conflicts build up, it's clearly when they start making these choices that we're talking about. The other thing is, and I, you know, is, is the expectation of what we think women should act like and what we as women oftentimes do act like. And, you know, I sit in a lot of the medical school meetings where we talk about, you know, evaluations and surgeons and personalities and leadership and, you know, a lot of the leadership qualities that allow you to get promoted continuously, whether it's just actually putting yourself up for promotion, are qualities that we don't necessarily advocate for women. And in fact, when they do it, they get pushback. And so I think students early on see that kind of underculture of self-promotion as not necessarily being a favored quality amongst uh, their female peers because a lot of times they see it in older women and they watch them not be positively reinforced. Whereas it, when they rotate through all the different services and they see surgeons necessarily or other kind of self-promoting personalities, um, on, on certain, in, in certain experiences those may be more, better, better absorbed than others. And I think that whole kind of culture contributes to the medical students coming through and being more aggressive when they look for their jobs and wanting academic jobs and then starting with promotion and stuff like that. So I think the students come in, actually, it's like, you know, childhood. They come in pure. They have very even expectations. And I think the best example I get is many of the residents, as they go through residency, start reminding me that this issue is important. They come into residency or graduate from medical school thinking men and women are equal and that the opportunities are equal, the voice is the same, and they're not going to be limited by their gender. And then as they graduate and start trying to promote themselves or trying to look for leadership, chief residency, whatever it is, they start to understand that there actually is a difference. And that usually also comes at the time when they start getting conflicted about other obligations in their lives. And they start making those choices for themselves. And very few people are advocating to help them stay in. They're almost all trying to help them survive. And so I think that, like, I, I do think this is a, a huge cultural shift we need to make for men and women. And I love that Dr. Jenna is the advocate on this and the lead author on this paper because I think that there, 
there is a lot of validity to the concept that this is not a women problem, that this is a gender neutral problem for medicine, and that we need to move forward as we develop students and residents going forward um, to to highlight that this is an issue for all of us. So I personally want to thank Dr. Jenner for doing this and being the lead author on this paper uh, and not letting all of us take this on as a women's issue, but as a, an issue in medicine all, all over the place. Dr. Jenna, um, just a, as a follow-up to that comment, did your research delve into the metrics that we're talking about, things like education and other responsibilities being on committees? It, does Doximity keep that kind of data, or is it mostly pretty concrete publications, grants, that kind of stuff? Uh, Doximity doesn't keep that kind of data, unfortunately. And uh, on top of that, physicians who are members of Doximity on their profiles, you won't typically see a lot of that information. So for instance, you wouldn't see that a, a physician has delivered 10 different lectures to medical students on these various topics. And so that's kind of hard to account for. And, and when we were writing this paper and, and kind of negotiating with the journals, that was a, a big issue that came up was that all of the reviewers said, well, we know that women uh, physicians on average tend to go down different career paths uh, in, in academic settings, which, which may be true. And of course, if, if you know, teaching lectures isn't, isn't rewarded in the promotions process, it's not a surprise. And so we responded to that criticism by saying, okay, let's look only at women who have NIH grants, major NIH grants. So these are women who clearly have, uh, both men and women who clearly have uh, designated that their primary interest is, is research as opposed to clinical care or teaching residents. And even among this, this group of uh, men and women physicians, you still found the same thing. So this is not just an issue of women choosing different career paths. Even within the career path of pure research, you still see this issue. Uh, the second thing I would say is that now I kind of see there's two phases to the problem. Uh, the first phase is what are the things that keep women from being less productive or less valued from the promotions committee? So that would be something like women being less likely to write research papers and less likely to apply for funding and more likely uh, to teach uh, uh, medical student lectures. So that's the issue. That's like the first phase of the problem. But the second issue is, and that first phase I think is an issue partly of, uh, of mentorship and, and institutional resources. The second issue is if you have a man and a woman who have the same number of publications, the same number of NIH grants, the same clinical trial participation, they're in the same specialty, they have the same years of experience, why is it that the, the woman is about 15% less likely to be a full professor. Now that's an issue of discrimination. Yes. That's not an issue yes. of different resources. Mm -hmm. And so both sides mm -hmm. of that issue have to be tackled. Right. Right. So if you um, if you were to think of something we could do, any of you, anyone can jump in for this one, that we could do now, um, what would be, um, Dr. Abuel point, uh, outlined a, a nice top, bottom, and bottom up um, program, but what can we do uh, when we leave this call today? Um, to to make it a little less of of a uh, a double um, double standard. Uh, Stephanie, go ahead. Yeah, I mean it's a great question. What can you do today? And I think a lot of it has to do with encouraging and mentoring your fellow faculty members um, to to go for it um, and, and to give them the encouragement that they need. I mean, I have a classic story from just a couple years ago of an outstanding young woman who was in our residency program and uh, we all thought that she was perfect to be one of our chief residents. And when we offered her po the position, she was remarkably um, uncertain and, and lacked a little bit of confidence that she could do it, which was mind-boggling to all of us because she had demonstrated leadership and, and amazing competency for, for three years. Anyway, she initially turned the position down, but you know we didn't take no for an answer and talked with her more, and she took it, and she did supremely well, as you might expect. And I do think it's interesting how much uh, encouragement and support, um, otherwise known as good mentoring, um, can can really help um, all faculty, but maybe women in particular, who, um, as we know, there is unconscious bias. That's what Dr. Jenna was referring to. And unconscious bias is something that both men and women have about women. 
And so women themselves in our culture have a certain degree of a sense that they value less if it's you know a, either accomplishments or CVs or whatever you're looking at, um, if it's done by a woman, even if it's identical to that done by a man, it's part of our cultural norms and stereotypes. So women often uh, lack a little bit of confidence, which I believe is sort of unconscious bias uh, that they're exhibiting themselves. And and an encouragement and actually talking about those issues, I think, can go a long way on an immediate sort of what we do when we leave this call. The other things uh, take more organization uh, and more leadership uh, to, to do, but, but I think we're, I'm sort of excited, I think we're approaching um, what might be a tipping point for this, and that's yeah. exciting. Kizel, can I ask a question? Yeah. So is Dr. Jenna, sorry. Um, so I have a question about, um, you know, like awards and promotion, um, like committees or silos within departments that are specifically geared towards women. Because I think that if we're talking about the promotion of women towards professor, getting an award or an honor clearly helps that happen. Yet um, I, I've seen pushback on committees that are specifically formed to nominate or promote women for leadership awards or other honors because it somehow minimizes the male's opportunity for those honors. Is there any data that you know that supports the concept of creating awards committees to promote women and men, but consciously to support women to promotion so that they, for honors, so they can get towards promotion? Uh, that's a good question. I, so I'm not aware of any data on that. I know at Harvard we have uh, specific grants that are tailored towards women, particularly who are tailored towards women with kids. Uh, and other specific yeah. awards, uh, but not, I don't know any data on that. Right. I'm sure there's institution-specific data, though. Do you think that does that sound like something that would, based on the, the the experience that you have, that would be a good idea as a small step that departments could do individually to help facilitate promotion in their individual faculty? Oh yeah, I think it'd be a great idea. I think it'd be a great idea. And the, the other thing I would add to Stephanie's point is that, you know, uh, there was a paper that came out in. Um, I think there was a proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences several months ago, which apparently raised a lot of controversy. And what it showed was that, uh, or what it suggested rather, was that women at the start of their career uh, are more likely to be hired relative to men. This was one of these kind of s secret shopper type studies where uh, fake CVs were sent out. And it looked like women were more likely to be hired than men at the same level of qualification, which would be in direct contradiction to what, what we find. And so and this is a high quality study that was published in PNAS, so it's probably quite good. And so the question is, you know, why could that be true if, if those results are true and our results are true? And the answer I came down to is that I think there's a transparency issue and a measurement issue. So I think what happens is that at the vice chair or chair or deanship level, uh, there is a, uh, you know, there, there is awareness that we need to be hiring more women in, into academic medical medicine roles. And so there's a pressure for that, and not surprisingly, people have risen to the occasion, and, and I think you'll see more and more junior faculty women being hired uh, as institutions roll out these policies. But if that's the only outcome that's measured, what you're going to find is that things will look good there, but they won't look good elsewhere. So if you don't start measuring and reporting and rewarding um, programs or, or departments based on how long it takes women in that, in that department to get promoted, or ensuring that the likelihood of promotion is equivalent between men and women once you account for all these other characteristics. If you don't measure that, if you don't report that, and if you don't reward that, you're going to have the same problem, is that you're not going to see the type of interest in that activity that you should. So my answer would be, there needs to be transparency. Institutions need to report this information publicly so people can see. Obviously, we don't identify names, but we say, okay, look, here's the data. This is the amount of people that were promoted, men and women, here are their characteristics, are there differences, and then people have to be held accountable for that. So uh, I'm going to say something really uh, a slightly, well maybe, a lot controversial right now. Um, so <laughs> Sarah's laughing, she's like, yeah, nothing's new. Um, <laughs> so I, I actually, I, when, I, when you were saying they hire more women early on, all things being equal, is it cheaper to hire women? Mm. And, and is that really, is it really, if we follow the bottom line, is that where the answers are? Um, because we know that women get paid less. We know that women don't negotiate well. We know that women don't ask for what they're worth. And so if, we're, if I were 
if I were somebody looking purely at the economics of this, I would think hiring somebody who is just as good for a slightly, it's like going to, you know, going shopping at a at the mall. If you if you get something 20% less, you yeah. might buy that if it's exactly the same product. Well, the um, the research letter that was in the same issue of JAMA really spoke to that. Mm -hmm. um, the one, sex differences and in institutional support for junior biomedical researchers, that the startup packages for men were $889,000 on average, whereas the startup packages for women were $350,000 or so. So, I mean, there is a massive difference in the cost of hiring um, a new researcher, man versus woman. Right. And the uh, and so I think there there is some something there that that may be uh, worth looking at. Um, so we're we're almost at the end of our time, and I just want to um, one last question for Dr. Uh, for all of you, Alyssa, Stephanie, Dara, and Dr. Jenna. Um, how um, what are your final thoughts on this on this topic? If you were to if you wanted something to be in great if you wanted everyone to hear one last final thought about um, where this this conversation should go uh, after we get off here uh, off this call, Stephanie, I'll start with you. Dr. Abiel. Okay. Um, gee, I have about three things I'd like to say, but <laughs> I, I mean, I think that um, every one of us needs to work within the sphere of where we think we have an influence, and for many folks, that's in their department. And I think we have to think about concrete interventions that uh, you, you can bring forward and try. Um, part of our big NIH TAC trial, which was the first, you know, trial, randomized trial in a, in a major uh, academic institution, over three years we did it and we worked at the department level and asked each department, I mean it was a multi-tiered intervention that we studied, but part of that was asking each department to come up with creative um, interventions that they could do. And not surprisingly, the interventions that came up in the Department of Radiology were entirely different than the interventions that came up in the Department of Pediatrics. And we also had basic science um, departments in this. We had 27 different departments randomized. And so working at that level, and what our work has also shown, is that culture is completely different from one department to another. So. I think working at that level is a good first step. Now, I, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be working at the highest level of the institutions, because institutional change is difficult and needs to happen, so we need to keep driving that. But I think on a daily basis and, and in our own influence, uh, circle of influence, working at the department level and getting together a group of faculty, you just can't believe how creative faculty can be when you ask them to try to come up with ideas that could make the environment better. They've got lots of ideas. It's just we need to ask them and we need to listen to them and then we need to experiment with them. Thank you. Dr. Westring, your thoughts? Um, I, I totally agree with everything um, that, that Stephanie just said. I think oftentimes when people see these issues, the low-hanging fruit is this idea of like, well, just fix the women. Right, mentor them more, support them more, convince them to go for it, teach them how to negotiate better. And I just think, <clears throat> well, that can be really useful. It's sort of a, a dangerous model to set up where you're sort of victim blaming and saying if women aren't successful, it's because they're not doing something right. Um, so continuing to sort of be really careful with this idea of helping impact and support the careers of women without making any sort of assumptions about what women should be doing with their lives or their careers or that everybody should want a leadership role uh, I think is it's a really important but also tricky uh, issue. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I would have to agree with uh, both of your points. Um, Dr. Jenna, your thoughts? I would like to see uh, more transparency at the individual institution level and, and see if that can then be tied to some sort of Obviously, the measurement has to be there, but some sort of rewards where we say, okay, look, these are the institutions that seem to do a good job in promoting women. And, you know, we, we have that data. We didn't report the data in the, in the JAMA article, but in some other work, we're looking to see what are the specific institutions that seem to be doing a good job uh, versus not. And, 
by airing that information, I would, I would imagine that institutions would then say, okay, look, we need to fix this as an issue. This is how we fare compared to other places. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I agree. Transparency, I think, um, if you've got nothing to hide, then, then you know, it's, it's good. And, and honestly, there's a comment um, in, in one of the articles I was reading, you're missing out on 50% of your, of your workforce. And uh, I think transparency is one easy, easy to say, hard to do uh, strategy. But shaming departments and institutions into it sometimes will work too. Um, uh, Dara, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, feminine? Fem yeah. I can never say it right. So, Dr. Cass, help me. <laughs> okay, so feminine, and I think that actually goes along with, I think, a little piece of what everyone has said, and that was actually going to be my point. So feminem is basically the first open access, you know, support professional development group for women in emergency medicine. And the concept is really about transparency. So you can't know if you're being treated fairly in your hiring practices if you don't know what the other hiring practices are of other groups or if your journey is similar to somebody else's. And um, so we, we, you know, publish articles and we're building a community of women in emergency medicine that can lean on each other and providing an opportunity to find mentorship and networking outside of individual departments. And I think that that's my thing about what we can do now for this. It seems as somebody that's solidly transitioning towards mid-career to the point where promotion is really becoming a thing that I want to advocate for for myself, peer pressure and peer support across genders is by far the most important thing for me as an academic professional. I think that it's really nice to have mentors that have done it and I can call them and ask them questions and it's great to mentor residents and students that are below me and tell them how I'm figuring out. But the people that can in that impact my journey the best and push me furthest are my peers. And so continuing to create either with professional development networks or institutionally or a, you know open access um, communities for women and men to feel supported is going to, I think, be the key to getting this middle group forward and changing the culture around um, individual promotion and success. Well, those are all uh, really important points that you've all made. And I'd like to just conclude by saying thank you. Thank you for taking the time to, to be here with us. Um, as, uh, all of you are very busy, I know, and it's it, it just... Um, I was really nervous about this, but I'm really glad that everyone came together and we were able to have this discussion that's recorded forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, these disparities are present. We have proof that they're present. We have solutions for these disparities. And I hope that in the next few years we'll start reading articles about innovations that are working, that we, we collective as, a, as, as an industry, talk to each other about what strategies work and what strategies don't work and that we collaborate and have an open, honest, um, brutal, sometimes brutally honest conversations about um, disparities, not just for gender, but for all, um, all other kinds of things. Um, so thank you again. And um, for those that are watching this, you can always go on to the Academic Life and Emergency Medicine website. Please visit um, uh, Dr. Cass's uh, website, feminem.org. <laughs> Thank you. Right. I, it takes me a minute. I'm a little slow, slow in my old age. Um, so, but thank you again, and I uh, hope to see you all soon at ASAP in thank Boston. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Thanks.